Hello, and welcome to this presentation on Car House Museum and Creative Center. I'm Pascal Halliday, Executive Director of Car House. Built in 1863, Car House today is a museum celebrating the life and legacy of Emily Carr and the themes of her life. Environmentalism, feminism, animal rights, uh, indigenous culture, and emerging creativity. Car House sits on the traditional land of the Lekwungen speaking peoples who are known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. The house sits near Beacon Hill Park, which was once Mekon Hill, a Lekwungen settlement until the 1840s. In the 1840s, much of the land in James Bay was developed by the Hudson's Bay Company as farmland. And in 1862, a wealthy merchant named Richard Carr bought four acres and commissioned a local architecture firm to build a house for him and his family. When the house was built, the neighborhood around it looked very different. In fact, it was so isolated that when Richard's wife saw the home for the first time, she burst into tears because she said they'd feel so lonely out there in the middle of nowhere. As you can see from the map on the other side though, Victoria has grown up around the house quite a bit. The house is a great example of the picturesque Italianate architecture that was popular in, on the West Coast in the mid 1800s. It was designed by one of Victoria's earliest architects, John Wright, and has some features that would have been very stylish in the mid 19th century. The finials and gables on the outside of the house, as well as the balcony, uh, give it the beautiful facade that the Victorians loved. And on the inside, it had some of the most fashionable features, a uh, faux marble wallpaper to imitate the appearance of marble used in English country estates, built-in fireplaces, and even the earliest indoor bathroom in the neighborhood. Uh, you can see in this photograph here, the exterior of the car's bathroom, which was installed when Emily was about five years old and was the first indoor bathroom in James Bay, and one of the first in Victoria. The house is most famous today because of its association with Canadian author and artist, Emily Carr. Emily Carr is best known today for her paintings, her landscapes of coastal uh, British Columbia and indigenous communities, and for her writing. She published, or she wrote seven books throughout her lifetime. Uh, only three of those were published during her lifetime, however. Four were published posthumously. Although today Emily Carr is probably better known for, for her paintings, her writings represent a huge part of her creativity. She began writing in the late 1920s after a heart attack restricted her ability to paint, and she was very insecure about her writing. It was rejected by publishers until 1941, when finally uh, she found a publisher for her first book, Clee Wick. It won the Governor General's Award that year, which was pretty surprising to everyone since Emily was unknown as an author and still basically unknown as a painter at that point. Emily followed that up with two more books before passing away in 1945 at the James Bay Inn, just two blocks from her childhood home. When Emily passed away, she left four manuscripts to her friend Ira Dilworth, who ensured that they were published after her death. Emily's writings are all based on her own experiences. They're not exactly uh, historical narratives, but they are memoirs and they're based on her own life, which makes them uh, an interesting source for us today as a historic house. We have a lot of Emily's memories told in her own words of her time growing up in this home. Emily's second book, The Book of Small, is specifically about her childhood spent in this house. Emily was the youngest of the daughters in her family, and although she did have a younger brother, he passed away at 23. By the time that Emily was writing, he had long since died. When Emily made up nicknames for the characters in her book based on herself and her sisters, she gave them names based on their place in the family's birth order. Uh, Elizabeth, Alice, and Emily were all quite close in age, so Emily called them bigger, middle, and small. That was her nickname for herself. 
The Book of Small describes Emily's childhood in Victoria in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, the city was still quite young. She talks about being a little girl in the little city with Victoria growing up alongside her. Today, the book has been a uh, great use to us in restoring Carr House to what it looked like when the Carr family lived here. Some of Emily's descriptions were used when we restored the house uh, and visitors can recognize many features from the Book of Small in Carr House today. Emily was born in this room or in this house uh, and she lived here into her adolescence. But after both of her parents passed away, Emily decided to leave home. At 17, she left the house to study art in California at a school in San Francisco. But after spending three years there, her sisters called her to come home. Her guardian, uh, her eldest sister, Edith, and the rest of the sisters thought it was time for Emily to either settle down and get married or find a job, start contributing to the family. They had been very wealthy when Emily was growing up, but since the death of their parents, that had changed. Edith was struggling to support the four youngest kids on what was left from Richard Carr's estate and trying to run a big house. Additionally, the Carr sisters were very busy with religious work, uh, a hobby that Emily didn't share. In fact, she trained her pet crow to attack the missionaries who would visit the house. This caused a lot of tension between Emily and her sisters. The house was also their means of income. Edith rented out rooms to boarders and taught China painting lessons on the main floor when Emily was a teenager. And Emily herself used the house as a business. After returning from San Francisco and realizing that her family wouldn't support her art career anymore, Emily had decided to support her studies herself. So at age 20, Emily opened her first art school in her family's dining room. After a while, her sisters complained about the noise and they kicked her out to the cow barn in the backyard. In the corner of this slide, you can see a sketch that Emily drew of the cow barn where she taught her classes. Uh, she hung an old boot on the back of the door and filled it with all the money she made teaching. After nine years, she made enough to send herself to art school in London at the School of Westminster. Throughout Emily's adulthood, this house would remain an anchor for her, for her. Her sister Elizabeth lived in the house until she passed away in 1936 and ran it as a massage therapy clinic throughout the 1920s. When Elizabeth died, she left the house to Emily and Alice, uh, who decided to sell their family home. At that point, Emily Carr was not a famous artist. Uh, she was struggling financially, and although her art had started to garner more attention, especially from the East Coast, she wasn't the Canadian icon that she is today and her paintings were definitely not selling for millions of dollars. She and Alice couldn't really afford to take on a big home like this. And so they decided to sell the house. Emily saw the house as a symbol of her childhood and wrote that she wished it could fold up and fly away and exist only in her memory. The house appears in many of Emily's books, uh, most notably the Book of Small, as I've mentioned previously. Uh, the House of All Sorts is actually a different house nearby. In, 19, uh, in the 1910s, Emily inherited a piece of her father's original farmland and built a boarding house where she rented out rooms to lodgers to support herself financially as she pursued her art career. At this point, Elizabeth was living in the Carr family home and their other sister, Alice, had started a business around the corner, a kindergarten. So the three Carr sisters were all sort of in a triangle in their old neighborhood. Uh, Growing Pains was Emily Carr's autobiography, which describes growing up in this house a great deal. And finally, one of my favorite details from The Heart of a Peacock, the peacock mentioned that in that title uh, actually was a real peacock who lived at Beacon Hill Park, who would come down and visit Emily at this house when she was growing up. After Emily and Alice Carr sold the family home, it became a boarding house, an apartment building, and was then abandoned. In 1945, the same year that Emily Carr passed away, the house uh, 
was left vacant and gradually fell into disrepair. Eventually the house uh, became so disheveled that the city decided to tear it down. In the 1960s, the city planned to tear down the house, but luckily the local member of parliament overheard the plans. David Bruce ran to the bank, remortgaged his home and used the money to save car house. For several years, art classes and art shows were run out of the house, but uh, they were the community that supported it was struggling financially to both restore the house and maintain its safety. Uh, it was in very bad shape. David Gruce continued to petition the government to take over the house, and in the 1970s, they did, making it a provincial heritage property and beginning the restoration of Car House. You can see here some photographs of the restoration of Car House. Uh, this was a very big job. It involved, in one part, uh, lifting up the house to add a foundation underneath, not to mention painstaking work in recreating the original wallpapers uh, and faux marble and faux woodwork finishes found throughout the house. Today, Car House is a provincial heritage property and uh, operated by the Carhouse Community Society, a nonprofit. We offer a variety of uh, art and literature themed activities, uh, as well as a few animal themed ones. Emily was a big animal lover and you'll see some photos of our annual pet parade here. The house as Emily Carr's birthplace is a special place for art lovers and literature lovers in Canada and throughout the world. Today, we aim to explore Emily's legacy and connect with our communities based on the values of that legacy. Creativity, uh, feminism, animal rights, environmentalism, indigenous culture, and emerging creativity. It being but it's actually been a part of the village in which it lives since the 16th century. So it has a long and rich history before Jane Austen came to live in it. And I'm going to, um, Pascal, if I can quickly hop on to share screen, then I'm gonna take you in to our virtual tour and we are gonna have a look at it in more detail. So my the picture of the Jane Austen house is behind me. I've got managed to got a groovy virtual background. And um, then what we're going to do is we're going to dive in to look at the house in just a minute. One of the fascinating things about this house and about Jane Austen's house is it's really been really memorialized and has become quite an iconic space in its own way. So we are going to have a look at our virtual tour, which you'll see just here. Hope everyone can see this. So you can see the house here. I'm afraid it doesn't look quite like this today. It's uh, We're in the middle of a rather bleak British December uh, with lots of rain rather than this very beautiful sunshine. This picture was taken on a lovely August day. And you can see the house here sitting right on the corner of the road. Now, this road is quite important because there are many conceptions and misconceptions about Austin that have been developed and reinforced by various biographers over the years. And some of those are one of the reasons why these three houses have come to talk today about the connection between landscape and isolation versus urbanization for these different writers as well. And Austin is often seen as retreating to this cottage in the countryside. And it was to a certain point, but in Austin's time, this road that we're on here, you can see it being brought back to very much Regency life here, was one of the major transport routes in the country. Today, it is quite literally bypassed. But in Austin's time, this would have been the main road between London and the cities of Winchester, which was originally one of the capital cities of the country, and Gosport, which is right on the south coast and was and remains a very significant naval base. And this was during the time of the Napoleonic Wars. So it's one of the reasons the ways that we can see that the house and its life has changed. So the house has expanded over the years. This section here 
was the first section built. And you can see there's all sorts of divisions and changes in the brickwork. And it started out way back, either one of the Henry's reign, either the Henry VII or Henry VIII. There is unfortunately no date inscribed on a beam anywhere that we've been able to find yet. But it started off as a timber framed farmhouse, originally called Petty John's. And then over the centuries, it has expanded and it has aggrandized. And for those of you who know persuasion very well in one of the Musgroves houses, it is a farmhouse that has been prettified into a cottage. And that is very much what we see here. Do we get this? I describe it as a baby manor house quite a lot, because when we have a cottage, it gives us quite, and particularly in the UK, we have quite a concept what a cottage is something quite small it's something quite humble and actually this is in its own way quite a grand house so it was home to Jane Austen between 1809 and 1817 we are in Hampshire which is one of the most southern counties in the UK if you're looking at the bottom of the country and where it sort of looks like a little poodle sitting upright we're right down at the bottom and we're about 15 miles from the sea here although that's far enough away to be a long way in the UK because we are that much smaller and Austin was born in Hampshire she was born in a village called Steventon which is about 16 miles northwest of here and she was the daughter of the parish vicar so occupied quite an interesting position in society there and she lived in her childhood home of Steventon for the first 26 years of her life. And she started writing very extensively there. She started writing as a teenager and she wrote all these wonderful and very strange teenage writings, which have the root of her mature writings, but are also show a much more rebellious and outrageous character than you might expect from some of the finished, from her finished and final novels. And then in 1801, her father decides to retire as vicar um, for the local factory, and he hands his parish over to his son, James, and Jane, her sister Cassandra, her mother and her father all move to Bath. And Bath is a big, beautiful, very Georgian city, very built up, very, very urban, lots of honeyed stone and columns, very long history, got beautiful Roman bars and things in there. Jane doesn't like it very much, doesn't like it very much at all. And we can often tell with Jane how much she likes where she is based on how much she's writing. And in Bath, that amazing creativity and outpouring of words really, really dries up. So by the time they leave Steventon in 1801, she has three volumes of teenage writings. She started writing something, well, she finished a short novella called Lady Susan, which you haven't read it. It's extraordinary and very, very not Austen. It's very naughty and it's fabulous. And she's also written the first draft of First Impressions, which will become Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, which was at that point called Eleanor and Marianne. By the time she gets to Bath, that really stops. That creativity just stops. She does write a fragment of something called the Watsons, but she never finishes it. And we don't even have too many letters from her from this time. Her father dies in 1805, and then the money sort of dries up as well. It's similar to we see with Emily Carr. You see this, there's money and then there's not. And then there's this period of quite significant housing insecurity and precarity. And then there's even less writing, there's nothing coming out. She moves to Southampton, which is a big naval town. Uh, if anyone's been on a cruise around the UK, you might have docked in Southampton, there's also an airport. And then in 1809, she and her mother and her sister, her father's passed away by this time, are offered this house. Her brother was adopted by some wealthy distant relatives and he inherited vast estates and vast money. To put into context, in 1812, 1813, when Austen is writing Mr. Darcy with his 10,000 pounds a year, her brother Edward has 15,000 pounds a year. So he was phenomenally wealthy. And he could have done all sorts of different things, but what he does do eventually, after they've had four years of virtual homelessness, offer them this house to live in, rent-free for the rest of the women's lives. So they set up this all-female household in this house. 
and comes to they come to live with them as a their sister-in-law Martha Lloyd and together they divvy up the household tasks and the domesticity to really enable Jane to write so on and also enable Mrs Austen to have a little bit of a break because by the time she's moved in here she's had eight children they used to run a school in the rectory she's moved about 15 well not quite 15 times that's an exaggeration but a lot of times um she's lost her husband and her children are on the way to producing 32 grandchildren between them so it's decided that she doesn't have to housekeep anymore and she quite literally puts her feet up on the sofa and um does her vegetable garden which she thoroughly enjoys and Cassandra and Martha take on the housekeeping, whilst Jane's job is to make br breakfast and the rest of the time she is free to write. And write she absolutely does. This absolutely tr triggers creativity for her. Within months of moving in, she brings out Eleanor and Marianne and she transforms it into Sense of Sensibility. And that is published in 1811. Pride and Prejudice is 1814. Uh, 1813, Mansfield Park is 1814. Emma is 1816. She has persuasion finished by the middle of 1816, and she then starts working on Sanditon. Northanger Abbey, she also edits and gets ready. She thinks a publication, but she doesn't quite get it. So it is an extraordinary period of productivity and creativity that is very, very much linked to this house. She then sadly becomes very ill, very young, and passes away at 41. We know... The last dates of her writing are around March 1817. And in May 1817, she leaves this house to go to the nearest city, Winchester, to be with her doctors and better doctors. And she passes away there in July 1817. And she still stay buried in Winchester Cathedral. So um, we go every summer on the anniversary of her death and uh, lay some flowers from the garden there. But with her death, something else starts. This is when we start the mythology. And this transformation of Austin from a living person into something else, something a little bit like a secular, a secular saint. It's a really complex position that Austin held in cultural studies and in, in iconography. And after her death, she is named as the author for the first time. Throughout her life, her novels are all published anonymously. They are by a lady, Sense and Sensibility, and then Pride and Prejudice is by the author of Sense and Sensibility, and so on. But her brother, Henry and Cassandra, get her novels published. And then she starts to take on this whole other entity. By the 1890s, she is really becoming incredibly famous. Her nephew, James Edward Austin Lee, wrote a biography about her in 1869. Another, well, her great nephew, published her letters with a biography in 1881. And then in 1890s, we start to see the people coming on tourism and they're writing that we have biographies, particularly from the States, particularly from the US. They are coming and they're writing about their experiences to visit Jane Austen's house. By this point, the house has been divided up. So Jane's sister, Cassandra, is the last of the Austen women to be living here. And she died in 1847. And the house is then divided into three separate cottages. So the end with these windows is one. You have a second here and then there's a third at the back. So it's become these three workers' cottages. But people are already coming to visit it as a pilgrimage. And you can see we have two plaques on the front of the house. And this one here, it's a memorial park for the 100th anniversary of Austen's death. And it says, Jane Austen lived here from 1809 to 1817, and hence, great use of hence, which I like very much, hence all her works were sent into the world. Her admirers in this country in America have united to erect this tablet. And I think it says, such art as hers can never grow old. The house is not in a particularly good state by this time. And then it's still lived in by tenants, it's still lived by workers. And then in the 1940s, a local lady called Dorothy Darnell, who walks past the house and is a great Austin lover, she's a great fan, she sets up the Jane Austen Society. They want to save this house and be able to, to open it as a museum as part of the great movement of, of writers' houses across the country. And they start fundraising um, to be able to open it to the public and to purchase it from the estate. Uh, like many estates after the Second World War, there was just no money. And um, the one estate, Chawton Estate, owned all of the cottages, all of the houses in this village, and they were slowly being sold off. 
and they would put an advert in the UK Times to save it. And a London lawyer called T. Edward Carpenter sort of swoops in and buys it and sets up the Jane Austen Memorial Trust and opened the house to the public in 1949. And you can see this is the second plaque. And here you can see that the house is very much a memorial to quite a few different people, as well as to Austen, and as well as to all these people that loved Austen over the years. It is in memory of T. Edward Carpenter's son who passed away in the Second World War. He was killed in action. And you can see the memorial as well to Dorothy Darnell. So you have these many complex layers of significance and history that come together to build this house. And we are just going to pop inside and have a look at one room before I stop talking about Jane Austen's house and hand over. And this is the drawing room of the house. And it was the first room that was open to the public in 1949. A lot of the other rooms beyond were still occupied by tenants. And it's at this point and in this room that objects were started to be collected to really tell that story and to bring it to life. One of the fascinating things about Austin's house is because it is always going to be a reconstruction. It means there's always going to be an element of storytelling, which I think for writers' houses is so perfect. It's so perfect that there should be storytelling and that the stories that we tell through these houses should continue to evolve and shape, whether that's through the objects that we collect or the way that we share our authors' lives because they do change and they do shape. And I can say that this picture was taken in, in August 2020 and this room does not look like this anymore. It's the same in essentials and it has the same wallpaper, but we've enhanced the way that we tell Austin's story through the house. Today, this year, we'll hit about, well, I don't know, we're not quite at the end of the year yet, but we'll have about 37,000 visitors who come and explore and share. And it's a really special place of both pilgrimage and inspiration. And I will stop. <laughs> Well, that was wonderful, Lizzie. Thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to pass the floor over to Dr. Alan McEachran to speak about the Green Gables House. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, um, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you all for attending. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I have COVID, uh, but I don't think I'm contagious. I think we all should be good, uh, but I may be reaching for the water quite a bit today. Uh, I'm going to try sharing screen, see how that goes. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Maybe the first thing I should tell you is that I always forget to look in chat while I'm talking away here. So that's one of many things I forget to do, I guess. Anyway. Um, I feel like, obviously, I feel like something of the odd man out here, uh, not only because I am a man, but because I don't represent the house that I'm talking about, although I have written about it. Um, this is Green Gables Heritage Place, which uh, may well be the most famous house in Canada. Uh, I'm throwing down the gauntlet uh, against Pascal and uh, Car House. I shouldn't do that on Emily's birthday. I know I apologize for that. But I, uh, when I do give talks about this, I sometimes say it is the most famous house in Canada and no one has really argued it too much with me yet. It's not the house where Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote Anne of Green Gables. Uh, it's not the house where uh, Maud grew up. It's not a house in which she lived. Um, it's not where Anne of Green Gables lived, because Anne of Green Gables is a fictional character. But it was a farm near where Lucy Maud Montgomery lived in Cavendish, Prince Edward Island. Let's see if I have that. Yes, I do. Uh, in Cavendish, Prince Edward Island, uh, it was a, a farm owned by relatives of, of Montgomery's, an elderly brother and sister. Uh, and then uh, owned by a younger, a young cousin, Myrtle McNeil, who took care of the siblings. Uh, Myrtle married Ernest Webb, and the Webbs raised a family at what will become known as Green Gables. They raised a family there from 1909 to 1945. Now, almost from the beginning of uh, 
Anne of Green Gables, from the moment of Anne of Green Gables publication in 1908. Uh, and it was, as many of you probably know, an immediate international bestseller. It was understood that Lover's Lane in the book was inspired by a path through the back of the Webb firm. Uh, Montgomery felt um, a great connection with this, a great uh, sense of belonging, ownership to that path and the woods. Uh, she felt she knew them. She felt uh, she loved them uh, more than anyone else could. Visitors began to arrive at the Webb firm almost as soon as the book was published. Uh, certainly by 1909, we have records of, uh, of literary pilgrims starting to come to the farm by 1909. Uh, to see Lover's Lane specifically, in fact, Ernest Webb put a, a sign to direct them. More and more visitors come in the 1910s and 20s, increasingly believing that the whole house and farm, not just the lane and woods, were the direct inspiration for Anne of Green Gables. This was helped by the fact that, that Lucy Ma Montgomery, now living in Ontario by this point, she would visit the Webbs when back on Prince Edward Island in the summer, and she would often stay with them. Um, so uh, she, she's written the book. It's becoming a place for literary pilgrims. She's returning there every summer. Um, by the 1920s, by the mid-1920s, the Webbs were keeping borders, uh, summer borders, in their house all summer, and more and more tourists were visiting. Uh, and the Webb House really becomes the heart of the fledgling Prince Edward Island tourism industry. Uh, and the association between the fictional and the real home really just grew from there. I love this example. It's uh, Here you can see a 1930 postcard of the Webb House alongside a handbill for the 1934 Hollywood film, Anne of Green Gables. You can see the Webb House uh, was becoming the real world manifestation of Green Gables. Even though the movie wasn't filmed at the Webb House, it wasn't even filmed on Prince Edward Island at all. Uh, this The Webb House was known as Green Gables and it was becoming to the world Green Gables. And I would argue that having the literary become literal in this fashion was very important to Lucy Maud Montgomery's brand. Uh, it gave her books uh, a Prince Edward Island, a Canada base of operations, and somehow made them seem all that much more real. In 1936, Parks Canada site inspectors were looking to establish a national park on Prince Edward Island. Uh, Green Gables wasn't even on their radar, but when they learned of the connection between the house and the book, they decided the park should be centered on Cavendish with Green Gables as its crown jewel. I love, I love the fact that they didn't even know how to spell Anne of Green Gables. And with an E is kind of a, a part of the book, but they spell it wrong. Man, am I right? The Webbs had little choice really to sell. They had to, uh, the National Park uh, came in and, and, and basically gave them no choice, said, if you don't sell, we'll expropriate. Um, but they were allowed to stay on as caretakers and the Webbs did stay on as caretakers for another decade. Um, and Parks Canada turned the property even more into the ideal of Montgomery's imagination. Uh, for the first time, only when it becomes a national park in, uh, after 1936, the gables were finally painted green. Uh, when Lucy Maud Montgomery died in 1942, her body was brought home to PEI, and the wake was held not in the home of close relatives or the church where she was to be buried, but in the dining room of Green Gables, the Webb House. Despite being another family's home, not to mention in the middle of a national park, Green Gables had become indisputably Montgomery's. Uh, and you can see this also in this photo I'm showing. I didn't have a photo from her funeral, but this photo of the memorial uh, of her in 1948 uh, shows hundreds of people coming to, um, to the house to celebrate her memory. And really ever since um, since then, since the 1930s, especially when it becomes a national park, um, it has become uh, this house, this really quite ordinary um, Prince Edward Island farmhouse uh, has been restored by Parks Canada to reflect 
uh, the setting of the novel uh, as uh, a typical farmhouse in the era when Lucy Maud Montgomery was growing up uh, and as the setting of the novel itself. Uh, the house welcomed, I'm not sure what the numbers are post COVID or, or post 2020, but in 2019, the house welcomed 210,000 visitors. Um, I write about the webs, Green Gables, Lucy Maud Montgomery, and much more in Becoming Green Gables, which will be published next summer. Thank you very much. Wow, that was just wonderful. I just want to thank all of our presenters for just giving um, awesome talks and introductions to these houses. And that really sets the stage for the discussion we're going to have now. And um, I was just really fascinated listening to each of your presentations about how ha these houses function as symbols of insecurity and security for these authors in their personal lives, but also the, the the house's own stories are a story of insecurity and security in terms of um, its ability to survive a his, as a historical landmark and be preserved over time. So that's something I, I hope we can examine as we go through these questions. But my first question for you is, um, in terms of the relationship to the author's personal lives, these houses offer a particular understanding of the sense of belonging they had in the spaces in which they lived, or in the case of Montgomery, in which they frequented. So could you please speak to the way these houses functioned as spaces of belonging or conversely as spaces of exclusion, these women, when it came to family dynamics? And I know, um, Pascal, you've touched on some of the sister familial relationships in terms of ownership of the house. Um, Lizzie, you've talked about the fact that Austin's brother made it possible for her to be in a house. Um, and I know that, uh, Alan, you mentioned the fact that Montgomery actually didn't even live in the house. So I, I'd be really curious for all of you to expand a little bit on how they functioned as spaces of belonging or exclusion. So I'll get Pascal to start and then we can just pass it along the panelists. Thanks so much, Bonnie. I, yeah, I think that's a great question because for so many of us, our homes are a place of belonging. And for Emily Card, this was the house where she was born. This was the house where she'd grown up. Uh, she had spent her childhood here. But I also think in many ways it represented uh, her family and a lifestyle that as an adult, she really chose not to live. Uh, the house was built by her parents and her father had grown up in poverty, made a lot of money during the California gold rush and was eager to show it off with a fancy Italianate cottage. As Emily got older and her parents had to carry the house and became guardian to the youngest four kids, including Emily, who was 16 at the time. Edith ran the house, uh, and Emily would later say she was very bossy. She nicknamed her the Kaiser after Kaiser Wilhelm during the First World War. Not a super nice nickname. Uh, but after Edith passed away, she left the house to Elizabeth Carr, another sister, uh, similarly very religious, um, very dutiful, and very... Uh, Preoccupied with appearances and maintaining the appearance of Victorian respectability in the car house. I think that for Emily, this house was always a place of home and a place of nostalgia for her. But I do. You know, Pascal, I think we're having some technical issues with that. I think that I Sorry, Pascal. I think we're having a, a little bit of a technical issue with being able to hear you clearly. Um, so maybe um, I'll just give you a minute to, to kind of see if you can sort out that connection and we'll pass on to Lizzie. Thank you. Yeah, it, the Chalkman Cottage and Jane Austen's house was really important to Austen's sense of belonging. She, she was very much 
and always was a member of her family in part. She was part of a really big family. She was one of eight siblings uh, with then lots of nieces and nephews and things. So she was very much connected to that wider family. So being able to have this household where they were able to be together and people were able to visit was really, really important to her. She was very much within that sense of family. And I think what's quite interesting about the house is it, it can look like the women are kind of shunted off to the side and they're in this cottage and kind of in the middle of nowhere. And there's a big house that a brother does own, but he's not really there. But actually, when you look through the real comings and goings, it's really a hub and it becomes a family hub. And it, in many ways, the cottage replaces their original family home. So it's really crucial to that sense of being within within the family rather than an exclusion, I think. So it's really important, that sense of space. Thank you. Alan, would you like to? Yeah, I would just add, um, the question of belonging is really interesting, I think, in Montgomery's case, because of course she didn't, um, of, all, of the sense of belonging or even ownership, because she didn't own um, this farm. She didn't own what becomes known as Green Gables. Um, she had a clear sense of ownership and of of uh, of the lovers' lane and of the woods and basically of the entire farm itself. A feeling of the of of nature that she had a, a sense of proprietary uh, ownership of of understanding the beauty of this place more than anyone else could. And there's a wonderful moment in her wonderful slash terrible moment in her diary in I think 1911 or so when she revisits the Webb farm for the first time after, I think after the Webb's bought it in 1909. So the first time she gets to see it afterwards. And it's clear that she's she's really concerned about what they may have done with it. And she doesn't even, mm -hmm. all of the Webb children are around her feet and she wants, she kind of wants nothing to do with them. She wants to experience Lover's Lane on her own and go visit on her own. And she's very relieved to find that the Webb's have actually, have, have, respected the place as much as she has respected it so he you get throughout her diary and then even right until the end of her life you get montgomery saying things like my woods when referring to these woods um or our woods but she doesn't actually seem to um offer the same sense of ownership or um claim the same sense of ownership about the house itself at the, at the house she recognizes she's a visitor she loves being a visitor and I think especially when her domestic existence in Ontario becomes more fraught she really welcomes the the old-fashionedness and the Prince Edward Islandness of of her returns to there in the summer uh so she she may own it um um in her soul, but she doesn't. She doesn't voice it as quite as much. Thank you. That's so interesting. The sense of of belonging to a place that you don't necessarily own, mm -hmm. and how that translates into these houses as cultural landmarks that readers often feel like a connection to or an ownership of, in terms right. of the relationship to the author's fictional works, but author the also the author themselves. And um, I agree with everyone in the chat. There are so many interesting things to talk about too with uh, Emily Carr and her relationships to these houses. And it's interesting that Pascal was saying that Emily might not have always felt like she belonged in the house that is now associated with her as kind of the cultural landmark. So that's, it's really fascinating to um, think about these, these things. Right now, I'm gonna ask if the panelists would mind um, speaking a little bit more to the fact um, that these houses, the environments, just as Alan and Lizzie were saying, had a profound impact on these authors' um, productivity and their writings. And um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the role they played um, in connecting to the imaginary houses that uh, the authors represented in their work. So the fact that um, the house that is called Green Gables wasn't actually Green Gables until after, you know, uh, Montgomery wrote the book about Anna Green Gables, and so it had its own history before it was connected to the um, the book. And so, if each of you wouldn't mind um, speaking, Pascal, I'm not sure if uh, your connection is is better right now. Would you like to try um, speaking? Uh, 
All right, hello everyone. I'm I'm hoping this connection is better. Wonderful. I think, uh, yeah, as some mentioned in the chat, Emily herself might be having some fun with our internet today. <laughs> um, Bonnie, would you mind just quickly repeating that question? Uh, I would love to talk a little bit more about the house. Sure. I'd like to hear more about how the house might have figured into the author's or Emily's fictional uh, representations or artistic representations in terms of how it shaped her imagination. I know that you mentioned the Book of Small, and she talks a lot about the house in the Book of Small, but it's also her interpretation of, of that house and how she saw it. So it's almost like a fictionalization at the same time. So yeah, if you could speak more to how it might have inspired or motivated different productivity in, in terms of Emily's works. Absolutely. I think one of the really interesting things about Emily's writing is that it really comes later in life for her. She didn't start begin writing until the late 1920s. And when she wrote the Book of Small in the 1930s, she was remembering her childhood 40, 50 years prior. Uh, one thing that I always find interesting is that that nickname, Small, uh, wasn't actually one that was used for Emily when she was a kid. It's one she made up for herself as an adult. And um, when she wrote the Book of Small, is, if anyone has read it, it's written in the third person, with Small being a character as almost a stand-in for Emily. I think that that's really fascinating how Emily uh, wrote this almost memoir, but with a stand-in character for herself. I think it also really speaks to how she saw herself in her family as the youngest girl. And how, you know, despite the fact that she did have a little brother, she wasn't the youngest in the family, she called herself small. Uh, when she wrote the Book of Small in the 1930s, she, her younger brother had passed away. So she was the youngest one still alive. And I think in that way, you can see how uh, Emily as an adult is coloring her recollections of the past. Thank you. Lizzie, would you like to speak? Yeah, one of the things that's so fascinating about Austin is she's really connected with these kind of grand country houses and the houses of, of her novels, but she very, very rarely describes them. So they are exact they are houses of the imagination. She's so sparing with her descriptive language. So even you know, Mansfield Park, which is the eponymous you know, site, is just described as a modern house with a park five miles round. And that is pretty much all you get. Pemberley, she describes the landscape, she describes the setting, but it's there's no great detail within that. There are a few, there's one real key exception, which does link back to the house, which is in Barton Cottage in Sense of Sensibility, which is the refuge of the Dashwood sisters and their mother, which is really interesting that again, that family dynamic, after they've been kicked out of their family home, Norland. And in that she describes Dash Barton Cottage as being in the rolling Devon Hills, which is a very, very pastoral landscape, very isolated. And it says it's imperfect as a cottage because it doesn't have green shutters, and honeysuckle. And in many ways it is not what becomes Jane Austen house because it is in this very rural isolation. But the internal architecture and layout is the same. So they're describing this have a corridor that goes to offices and two drawing rooms 16 feet square on either side and then attics and garrets above. And so that is the house. And you do see this vague sense of autobiographical detail coming in there because after the Dashwood sisters move in and the family move in, they describe unpacking the piano and putting paintings on the walls and Jane played the piano and her sister drew in a very similar mimicry of Eleanor and Marianne. And then you get, a, she does this beautiful, very poignant line about them putting their books and their belongings around them in an endeavor to make themselves a home. And so it's one of the very few times where you can possibly link, possibly, it's not definite, but there's enough, I think there's enough circumstantial evidence to see those links between the two and to see that emotional importance of Barton Cottage for the Dashwood Sisters and Jane Austen's house for the Austen women. I think that's just so fascinating, Lizzie. Like, it seems to me that's very similar to what's going on with Montgomery because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Green Gables is, um, you know, arguably one of the more integral settings 
uh, in all of literature. It appears in the work's title. It helps define the title character. And yet the place itself is really not well defined at all. Uh, there's a reference to it as dimly white house at one point, and that's about it. And I think that that's one of the the things, the fact that, that the house is kind of a blank slate um, allows um, allows a lot of people to kind of find it on their own, but it also meant that it allowed a real house in the in this case to be defined as oh this is the one that she must have met, and yeah. um, I think one I mean Montgomery writes other Anne books obviously after the first book not just the first book becomes famous but after her house or her house. Freudian slip after the Green Gables house is becoming starting to becoming famous but there's no I would say there's no evidence in either direction that she makes Green Gables more defined as being like the web farm or less defined like the web farm like they, they really do they are in different worlds wonderful well, I'm really enjoying this discussion and I have more questions, but I wanna make sure that the people in the audience who've been so graciously listening have an opportunity to voice any questions they might have. So before I continue on, um, I'd like to open it up to anybody in the audience who might wanna type their question in the chat, or if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, Dr. Scarth will uh, be happy to either voice your question for you or you can voice it yourself. And yeah, we'll see how many questions we have and if there's any time for more of mine. Uh, I have a question then. I was wondering what the most interesting artifact or object is at each house, in your opinions. That, that's a really great question. Um, I'll answer first, if you don't mind. We have a couple good artifacts. We have the bed where Emily Carr was actually born. Uh, but my favorite artifact is the Carr family Bible. Um, and it's an old 19th century family Bible started by Emily Carr's parents, where her father and then her sisters recorded the births and deaths in their family. Um, you know, during an era of paper record keeping, these family Bibles were a portable way to keep track of those important dates. And I think it's so fascinating to look at how the handwriting changes on the deaths page as the Bible is passed down between members of the family. Uh, the final entry in our Bible is Alice Carr, who died in 1953 at the age of 84. Uh, she wrote her name in her own handwriting, and then after she passed away, someone else filled in the date. I just think there's so many stories just in the handwriting on that page. I think for me, I'm going to be a bit cheeky, and I'm going to claim four objects because they link together. Um, and they are a series of letters that Austin writes from the house over a period of 17 days. And it starts from uh, January and goes through to early February. And it's over the time period when Pride and Prejudice is being published. So the first one is before it's being published and they're just at home and the weather's awful and her mother's knitting gloves and she's got a present of cheese from her brother. And it's all business as usual. It's a bit like the hero's journey narrative in, in, in miniature. And then the next letter, she's received her own copy of Pride and Prejudice from London. She calls it her darling child. And she details how her and her mother read the novel aloud to their friend and they perform it. Then by the next one, she's, she's not very happy with it. She's, she's got a bit of a crisis of confidence and she's pleased to get everyone's praise. And then she starts to kind of criticize it and say it's a bit light and dark. There should have been more shade. And then by the final one, the final letter, she's she's like, oh, you know, I'm actually I'm actually quite happy with it. But thank you. Please do send more praise nonetheless. And they're a really interesting set of letters because they're one of the, again, the few times that you see Austin talking to herself talking to her sister about being an author and particularly to the reception of such a significant novel as well is so is so fascinating and they're also so rooted to place um oh 
All right, I think we might be having a technical issue. Um, so Alan, would you like to respond sure. to your question? Um, yeah, we lost you there for a second there, Lucy. Do you want to do you want to try to finish up again? Or? Oh, sorry, I did realize everyone froze. So I'm um, sorry. It's something in the Gremlins, isn't it? In the air tonight. I don't know what it is. It's Jane's birthday on Saturday, so she's obviously not happy about being talked about either. Um, they're just these lovely letters, track Austin's reception of herself as an author as much as the reception of her books. And they're linked back to place. So what's, yeah, the, her sister's, she's writing them to her sister who is staying at their childhood home where the novel was first drafted. So they're really lovely circular piece of writing. So they're beautiful. So they'd be my favorite objects. I don't have a favorite artifact, I'm afraid, Kate. And I'll blame Park Canada a little bit on that because they basically, um, when the webs left, they they were allowed to and told to take everything with them. So everything that you see in the house now um, is is not from that era at all, or at least not from that house from that era at all. Um, I think the thing that I wish was an artifact would I, I wish that in some corner of the house we could find all the layers of wallpaper that they were putting up year after year after year. I mean, uh, old houses with um, four stoves going at any one time, and uh, tourists coming every summer, and so every June they would wallpaper that practically the entire interior every year. And uh, I would love if there was one place where in the house where you could see all that, but I don't think that's been retained anywhere. That would be a nice detail. Yeah. See how the fashions change. Thank you all. Um, there is a question um, from Heather Sinclair in the chat. Um, and Heather writes, do we have evidence that Montgomery or Carr read Austin um, or if Carr read Montgomery? I feel there's probably... 50 people in the audience who could answer that better than I could. So I'm um, not going to take to this. I might pick on Emily Worcester if she is still here. Emily, um, maybe she's, I don't know if Emily is still in the audience, but she's certainly someone who could speak to that. I know that uh, Montgomery read Austin. I can say that for sure. Anyway, if there's anyone who would like to yeah. jump, feel free. I I believe that um, Carr read Austin. I know her sisters did. Mm -hmm. uh, her sister Alice seems to have been a pretty big fan of Jane Austen's writing. Uh, and I also, I know Emily was a big reader. I don't know if she would have read Montgomery. Um, you know, she would have been in her sort of late 30s, early 40s when Anne of Green Gables came out. So I think she might have been a little bit old uh, for the publication, but I do think that Emily's depiction of herself in the Book of Small as this very rebellious, outspoken young girl shares a lot with Anne Shirley. Hmm. Well, and Bonnie Tulloch, our moderator, is interested in exploring these connections between Emily Carr and Ella Montgomery, so stay tuned. Um, another comment in the chat from Terry Brolt. Um, I appreciate the comment about the houses being part of evolving stories. I really like that, too. Can the panel discuss any tensions or challenge challenges to foster evolving narratives of the authors and the houses versus upholding enduring narratives? I think that's a great question. And I think it's something that we grapple with every day as historic houses. Um, of course, people visit because they want a connection to the past and to these authors. But, uh, you know, these people's legacies are always evolving and our views of them and the information we have on them evolves as well. Um, for Car House, I know this house uh, was built in 1863 and it's very much a Represent, representation of colonial society in Victoria. Uh, Emily grew up in a very British colonial world. And in many of her books, she discusses uh, the feeling of Victoria and this house versus some of the indigenous communities that she would visit uh, and the conflict between the two cultures. Uh, Car House is always trying to incorporate more diverse narratives into our interpretation. And part of that has been exploring Emily's visits to indigenous communities, uh, as well as the way that she used indigenous symbolism in both her artwork and her writing. We, you know, I really think that it's an opportunity here at the house to always be bringing in new perspectives and constantly be updating our interpretation and adding new interesting information for visitors. Uh, and I, I really like to see 
see it as uh, an opportunity rather than a problem to keep th this house evolving and relevant to our community. I completely agree. I think it's so important to stay to stay relevant, relevant to evolve. I think there's there's more of a danger of staying preserved in aspect. You go right. This is this is how it was. This is how we understand this writer, and to not change. There is constantly for so many of these writers, for all of our writers, there's emerging scholarship that that is looking at these writers in different ways. And I think you know the first biographies of Austin are written in the 1860s, where there is such a perception of how women were expected to behave. This is the era of the angel in the house and John Ruskin writing how the best way that you can tell a good woman is by only seeing her, her influence rather than hearing her voice. And that's the that's the framework against which these first biographies of Austin are written. And that remains influential for really nearly a hundred years. So we actually have to reassess because the context of criticism also changes and to interpret these houses properly it has to be linked to research and it has to be linked to criticism whilst at the same time understanding that these houses are also in many ways they are places of escape they are deeply connected to uh well-being as well because they people have personal collections with these authors so you do have to have where the tension is 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 balancing that is balancing between going you know, we want to we want to show this author as, as as this person, whilst not losing sight of the fact that there is a huge emotional significance. I think for me, that's where the tension lies. I think I would say, um, even though Parks Canada chose, um, basically chose Cavendish, chose. Um, because of the connection to Green Gables, because of the connection to Lucy Maud Montgomery. Um, they didn't really do much with the Lucy Maud Montgomery. They didn't know what to do with the connection for a long time. Uh, and uh, so one of the things they did, for example, was uh, they tore down the barns that uh, were, were uh, and they built a golf course right around the house um, to the point that I, I have a memory. It may be a fake memory, but I have a memory in the 1970s um, of going to Green Gables and hearing golf balls hit the side of the house because the green was right up next to that, the front yard of the house. And so one of the stories I think of Green Gables is the way that the, um, the, the, the interest in Montgomery has not gone away. And one result is that, that the, uh, that Green Gables has pushed away from the house. That Green Gables has pushed away the uh, uh, pushed away the golf course. That more area is given over to the idea of um, of Green Gables and to this uh, Montgomery story. And there's more dedication to that because I think people have demanded that uh, that sort of dedication. What I would like the next thing Parks Canada to do would be to start recognizing the human, the actual human history of the place, and to also recognize that um, uh, that places like this have histories since becoming parks, because it's now almost a hundred years, and also has had histories because they've become parks. That actually making them a park has actually changed the history of this place as well. Great, thank you um, very much. We have some more questions um, in the chat by direct message. We got the question, what happened to the house um, where Ella Montgomery lived as an author and why didn't it become a place of pilgrimage the way Green Gables did? Um, Alan, would you take that one? Well, a quick answer was that um, an uncle decided, was getting tired of the literary pilgrims in the 1910s and ultimately decided to tear it down in 1920. And that that left the web farm as almost Green Gables by default. Um, there was a little competition in the 1910s. You, you read articles about Montgomery um, that show her childhood home, but don't show the web home at all. Uh, but in the 1920s, um, with that house now gone, uh, it's it's clear sailing for, for Green Gables. I guess I would say that. 
And you can still visit the site where Montgomery spent most of her life until she got married and where she wrote Anna Green Gables. It's right next to Green Gables um, Heritage Place. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are quotes from the journals um, and it placed appropriately throughout the landscape. Thank you. All right. Another question from Darlene Clover. What is the public educational import of these houses in terms of not just these women, but women in general in the past and the present and future? I think uh, these houses can be so important because when we look at the past, women have been historically confined to the home in many eras. Um, Lizzie mentioned the idea, you know, the angel of the hearth, the domestic angel. Uh, These houses can tell us a lot about the lives of women in the past in ways that are often left out of records. Uh, Things like daily duties, um, you know, just the everyday ephemera of life can often tell us things that are left out of uh, historical records written about and by the elite. I think in terms of educational importance, these houses are a really great resource, both uh, to educate people about the past, but also to create connections between visitors and authors. I think it helps make these historical figures real and helps people understand them as complicated individuals, just like themselves. I think these houses provide a really concrete and physical link with the authors, uh, especially in cases like Emily Carr, where the author is so closely tied to a location. Emily Carr is iconic for the West Coast of Canada, and in many ways her paintings and books have become emblematic with the province's identity. And so it's, I think it, this house does have great educational importance as uh, an interpretive center and a place to discuss this artist who has become so important to the province. I would completely agree with so much of that. I think these these houses are, you know, Emily Carr is an iconic figure and in the same way ways as, as, as Austin has become and an icon. And I think we have to remember these people were living, breathing humans, just like everyone else. And I think one of the things that's so interesting about these kind of female-led domestic houses and these domestic spaces is there's very rarely a study. When you go to women writers' houses, I'm including the Bronte Parsons and this, Virginia Woolf's house is different because she was living in a time where women had a different scale of economic power to these slightly earlier writers they didn't have a study they're writing within the domestic space as well and I think in many ways that's that's inspirational to be able to show look what we can look what Austin can do from the corner of her dining room look what Carr can do from the barn in the back of the house and I think that's really important to be able to show that I think it's also important for those hidden stories and those kind of those hidden domestic burdens and actually how that has an impact on creativity. Um, Austin is working on persuasion and her sister's away and she's having to do the housekeeping. She actually writes, I cannot think of composition when my head is full of joints of mutton. And actually I think these spaces give us a chance to have those conversations that are still ongoing about the domestic burden, not just about chores and actually doing them about the emotional burden and where that labor lies and where it where it was in 1812 and 1823 and 1860 and where it is today. And actually it gives us, I think these visits are always, they're like a point on the time continuum and you can, they allow us to look back and forth. So I think they're hugely, hugely important for not necessarily understanding it because it's it's a big but to provoke conversation as much as it is to learn i think i'm going to have to offer an awkward completion to this because i think the green gables house is um uh is is kind of is awkward in what it does now um in that it 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 both um uh what's the word reflects the setting of the novel itself. And it, it's, so it's doing double duty. It's reflecting the setting of the novel. It's also reflecting um, the a typical island farmhouse uh, at the time when uh, Montgomery was growing up. Um, so it's, it's more of an archetype 
inside than it is an actual house um, and represented as an actual house. And I think that makes it a little bit more difficult to tell a real story when you're trying to tell, you're trying to create an ambiance more than anything. Kate, you're muted. All right. Um, no, Leslie Clement just weighed in with a comment saying that Alan Montgomery's Ontario houses, especially Stale Mance and Church, seem to be doing many of the things that the Carr and ha um, Austin houses are doing. Yes. And we talked about the McNeil Homestead um, from Montgomery's early life, but you can also visit Lee Stale and Norville as well in Ontario. I don't see any other comments um, in the chat. Oh, another one. Yes, here we go. An another observation. Um, stability in housing and supportive community help people thrive. How many women did not produce art or literature due to unstable housing? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a great point. And um, of I think, you know, when we read stories of these famous artists, it can be or famous artists and authors, it can be difficult to remember that they are real people. And that like real people having a warm place to sleep and a roof over their head gave them the ability to create and work on beyond their basic needs. Um, I do think that there are some examples, though, of uh, the, how domesticity can limit creativity. Emily's eldest sister, for example, Edith Carr, was a China painter in her own right and had uh, won some awards in local art festivals. But then, you know, both of her parents passed away and, and she was left to care for four teenagers in a house and a farm that she had to take care of. Edith doesn't seem to have done much painting afterwards. And it's understandable because she had suddenly this huge burden of a uh, both caring for the family and providing for them. Later on in Emily's life, she would inherit a small piece of the family's farmland and build a house there where she ran a boarding house, renting out rooms to make extra money. She had hoped to support her art career that way, but she spent so much time cleaning rooms and cooking that she had no time to create anymore. And uh, in the end, she had to swap the house for something else. Uh, so I think, you know, our homes can be both uh, an anchor and a place of creativity for us. I think there's also a valid point, um, particularly with, with Austin and a lot of the writers of, of her generation, that Austin was writing from a position of really quite considerable privilege. She was the poorer relation but of, of wealthy people, but she was still within, you know, the financial elite. She was within, you know, when she was born, she was within... You know, for income, top kind of 15% of the population. Her father worked, um, but her mother didn't have to in this time when many women were working and access to even literacy was really difficult. There were, with around the time of the French Revolution, there was a real fear from uh, government and from decision makers that if the population was too educated, they'd rebel. And right. so there was, for a long time, there was an active process of not extending education and doing these different things. So there are many people who, I can't imagine the best sellers that were lost through lack of access to, to education, of lack of access to literacy. It's, it's such a defining thing. And you can see the vast number of novelists and writers and stories and memories that start to appear once you have a democratization of education. It is so important. And I think we can't forget that, yeah, Austin was a genius, but she didn't have to empty her own chamber pots or wash her own clothes or make most of her food or worry about, she did have to worry about money, but not in the way that somebody that was really, really had to worry about money did. And I think that's important to remember not in a way to diminish her genius, but exactly as the question was asking, who else was lost through through that lack of access? Hmm. I think even the fact that, uh, I think, I mean, you'd have to take a poll at Carr House and Austin House and that, and at Green Gables House, but uh, there's got to be some people to go to to get a sense of, of um, I hope it rubs off on them. 
hope it rubs off the, the idea of having a domestic, of watching, of going to this domestic space where a great writer wrote in your cases um, and imagine like what, what kind of, what kind of writing space do I need? Um, I think that's one of the lovely things on um, the uh, uh, Anne manuscript.ca, which was came out last year, that lovely little video that starts it out um, about Montgomery writing, just uh, uh, finding a domestic space and writing. And I think that that's so powerful. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. We'll finish with one last question. That's for our host, Pascal at the Car House. Um, so it is about the O'Reilly family. Um, so Victoria, BC also has Point Ellis House. The O'Reilly family had much more in the way of financial resources, multiple renovations, lots of fine furnishings. Did the O'Reilly's and the cars have any contact? No, oh, you're muted. Uh, the O'Reilly's and the cars did have contact. They socialized together as, uh, you know, British families in Victoria in the 1860s. There's even a great children's book by an author named Kit Pearson that imagines a friendship between Emily Carr and Kathleen O'Reilly. Um, when Emily's mother was near the end of her life, she had tuberculosis, uh, Emily and some of her sisters were sent to a friend's house so that they wouldn't be there when their mom was so ill. And that house was beside the O'Reilly's house, beside Point Ellis house. So there's pretty strong connection there as well. Um, it's also interesting in that the O'Reilly family kept their money. Um, they stayed wealthy uh, through several generations and the house transitioned straight from uh, being a private home for the O'Reilly family into being a museum. There was nothing in between. Car House, on the other hand, was an apartment building and was abandoned for almost 20 years between the 1940s and the 1960s. So when uh, it became a museum in the 1990s, they had to bring everything in. Most of the furniture that we have is replica or it's an antique from the time period, as opposed to Point Ellis House, where I believe you know, even the pens on the desk are original to the O'Reilly family. That's amazing. All right. Thank you so much. I am going to turn things back over to our moderator. All right. Well, thank you for such an enriching discussion, both for the questions that the audience has asked and to the panelists who have provided such great answers. I think that's what's so fascinating about this discussion of houses is how the ideals associated with home also exist alongside the realities of lived experience, which are always complicated by tensions and cultural dynamics that are always changing. And so that's something that's unique to consider when we recognize how they serve as kind of monuments to authors' legacies and how that can actually be a positive thing for being able to think of these houses throughout history and how they can grow to embrace conversations um, that we're having today. And so I'm really excited that this was our first one. And obviously there's a lot of storytelling to, to continue. I loved Lizzie's comment that she made about how these sites are sites of storytelling. And um, I think that that is going to be really wonderful as we pursue more events like these to collaborate. And so I'll pass it over to Pascal to close out the event. Thanks so much, Bonnie. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Bonnie for moderating today and to Lizzie and Alan for joining us. It's been a great discussion of some fascinating stories and a lot of a lot more places to explore in our upcoming events. I want to mention that we will be having another panel on March 6th, uh, once again talking about female authors and historic houses, the connection between writing and home. Uh, so uh, Keep your eye on our social media and on carhouse.ca where we'll be announcing that date and the time shortly. Uh, once again, thank you so much everyone for coming today. Uh, thank you for being part of our celebrations of Emily Carr's birthday here at Car House. Happy 152, Emily. Uh, if anyone would like a copy of a recording of this panel, please feel free to get in touch with us at carhouse at telus.net. Thank you so much everyone.